The first thing was I asked you to please fill out the Excel file and then email it to Feather Mountain. Have you all done that? Good. Okay, then we have no problem. And next, it's vowels and consonants, chapter five. Any questions? Yeah, good. On page. On page 48. Uh-huh. Frequency. Um, Right. It's very much affected by the position of the lips. Right. But I don't really get it. How does that really That's an easy question to answer. Remember for format one, it's the flicking format and the creaky format. Oh, that's format one. Mm -hmm. Format two is whistling and whispering. Format three, we don't have any particular space that we can measure or point to. We don't have any little tests like that. Foreman 3 has mostly to do with lip rounding and R's, mm -hmm. rhotics. And they go together because in English, R is rounded. So one thing we can tell you is that it has to do with lip rounding, but we can't tell you which space it is. I thought there's something affected by the position of the tongue. The position of the tongue will also do it, but the main thing about F3, F3 is really hard to describe. We can't tell you exactly what goes into it. A bunch of different things go into it. But the one thing we're sure of is lips. So it definitely involves lip rounding and R's. Those are the two things you need to remember. Other things are going on inside and for all this stuff that they've written about the formants and we rely on them a lot in phonetic analysis, we still do not understand exactly what they are. Exactly what part of the oral cavity creates each format. We can only tell you generally. F1 and F2, those are just general guidelines. It doesn't really solve the whole problem, but it gives you a pretty clear idea. As for 3, just remember rounding and R's. That's enough. It also says, says, says mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. that format 2, uh, second format, has something to do with the ground. That's right, because F1 is about tongue height, F2 is mostly about frontness or backness of the tongue. So just remember those three ways of classifying the formants or keeping track of them. F1 is creaky and flick formant, and it has to do with tongue height. F2 is the whistle and whisper formant. It has to do with if the tongue is more front or more back. But the relationship between the tongue being front or back is not quite as piao liang, as gan sui, as it is as Tongue height is with F1. Tongue height in F1 is a pretty good correspondence. Tongue frontness or backness corresponds to F2, but it, the guanxi is not quite so liang as F1 is with tongue height. So guanxi jing yu yi din din ai mei, but gen ta de qian hou yu guan. And then for three, it's what I just described. And if you have that clear in your head, I think that's good enough. Then we're going to just start looking at numbers. Is that okay? Yeah, good, thank you. Good question. Anything else? Anybody else questions on chapter five of vowels and consonants? Were there things that you really didn't get? There still should be things that you didn't quite get because we haven't gone over the basics of, of acoustics yet. Yeah. Right. How do bat and bad sound in, in northern cities? Yeah. All right. I come from the Twin Cities in Minnesota, and we actually are also influenced by the northern cities accent. And I think I told you, I got made fun of by somebody once because I said, you peg instead of pig. So it sort of goes down to eh. Now, you know that link that I put on Facebook, a vowel trainer, accent training coach software? You will hear northern cities accents there because I got a, a lot of the vowels wrong myself because they're picking out vowels from the speech of many different people and there's one thing I don't agree with that they do is they use, they use a short vowel for the coda of the syllable. That means short vowels are not supposed to occur in open syllables, right? 
Well, you can say that's not really true, like kitchen, kit. That's an open syllable. So I don't go that far. I will only say that short vowels do not occur at the end of a word. For that, I can be pretty sure, unless it's onomatopoeia or a foreign word, etc. So short vowels do not occur at the end of a word. And in this software, he has sounds like he, he, hu, like this. And it's really hard to tell the vowels because these sounds do not occur in English. We do not have he. We have he, but it's only as onomatopoeia, he, 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 when you're laughing. <laughs> so you can, what I was saying is you can hear some examples of the northern cities vowels in there. When they say he, it was supposed to be he, but I heard e. So I got a lot wrong as a native speaker, and I'm, I have an ongoing conversation now with the person who designed this software. And we're finding out where we disagree. We're not going to agree. So we're just finding out where, where, where we disagree. Now, um, mainly what I can say is like, he will become he. Like pig, when I said it that time and got made fun of, was I said peg. And milk sounds like milk. And I remember saying that a lot when I was a kid. So I've still, I've got some northern cities influence in my English. Not so much now, but more when I was younger. And as for the other ones, I can't give you precise things, but I'm sure you can find it online. This gives you an idea, though. Okay? They, they tend to get lowered, as far as I can tell. Anything else? Quickly, because we've got lots of real fun stuff here. Anything else? That's it. What chapter should you work on for next week? Finish. <laughs> chapter six for next week, yes. And if you still don't understand things, write them down in your notes. As we go through acoustic phonetics, a lot of things will become clear. And then you can go back to your notes and see the parts that you didn't get the first time, and you'll go back and you'll get them the second time. Okay? Everybody will. I promise you. That was vowels and consonants. Please hand in your summaries. What we're mainly going to do today is work on more web pages, because without the web pages, we really are not ready for Chapter 8, especially the way it's now structured. So. If we're really fast and inefficient, which we almost never are, we'll try to do three web pages. If, we're, if it's business as usual, maybe one and a half. So we'll just see how things go. But no matter what, it's going to be fun. It's just really interesting and cool. Because we're going to be figuring out things that were around you, that are around us, always have been, but we never were aware of. Like, I heard your shocked reactions when I showed you the difference between ah and <whistles> everybody went oh that was pretty cool wasn't it now that's one example of something that has been around all the time but you had no idea you had all those lines in your voice right you just had no idea that's a tiny example of other things that are coming they're there and they're really interesting but you never ever thought of it didn't know about it. a lot of things like that Beyond that, there are many things that are like that that we're not going to do in this class. So I think nobody has the right to be bored in this life. We have no right to be bored. There is so much interesting stuff. You're just not looking if you're bored, right? Your brain is tired out. You don't feel like doing anything. But as for things to explore in this world and in this life, I think it's limitless. There are just things around you that you're saying, oh, there's nothing to do. But look at all those lines, you know? Learn about the lines. <laughs> all those overtones. We're going to go over the same page again so that we can put in the part about the guitar. And let's try to arrange it so we can have the page open and that we have our guitarist in a place where the camera can photograph her. I'm going to be a female, I guess. We've been over this page, but now we're going to actually demonstrate how this stuff works. We demonstrated with the software on the computer, but now we're going to do it with a physical object. And I told you that we have a fundamental frequency, that's the pitch, how many times it vibrates in one second. But then the string, if we're talking about a guitar, it cuts itself in half and the two sides go bouncing up and down in opposite directions. And then it also at the same time cuts itself into three pieces, four pieces, five pieces, etc. Now, we saw the overtones displayed with the software, but now we're going to use our ears and we're going to use the tuner, so you can get the tuner already, to actually experience them 
in the real world and not just on the computer. Okay, this one is partly real world because we're using a real voice. So we've got the guitar here. So Amy, do you want to go sit there? Actually, we only need one string. You can sit down. I'll put it on your lap. And you're going to lay it down like this. Because all you have to do is play one note, this one, E. It's the lowest note, and I pick it because we can go up higher without the pitch going way too high. That's the lowest pitch we have. And I added a little part to this page after class last time. And here we have the information we need for the guitar. The full length of one string, of one string, we need our measurer here, is 66 centimeters. So let's measure it to make sure. You need to measure it from the nut to the bridge. You need to measure the full length of E. They're all the same length, but measure the, the, this one. Okay, not down to there because the string stops vibrating here and it stops vibrating there. This is the nut and this is the bridge. All right, what's the length? Do we have 66 centimeters? If it's 65.5, then we need to, okay, it starts right here. It starts right here. And it ends, ends here. So it should be 66. Okay, measure it over here. Actually, this is the string we're using. Not that it should make much difference. But it should be about 66. There we go, okay. Careful, it'll hurt your finger if you're not careful. Uh-huh. Now, let's just listen to that note. It's a low E. This is our first note. It's the full length of the string, and we're going to have vibration like... This one will help us calculate, but I've already put the numbers up, so... There. There's the harmonic series. You can look over on the right side. When we play just the open, we call this an open string, it's going to be vibration mode number one, right at the top. It's just going up and down. That's what we're hearing. That's the pitch we're hearing. So go ahead again. All right, everybody get up. We're gonna get close to the guitar. There's not that many of us. You don't need to bring stuff with you unless you're helping with the tuner or something. And then try not to block Amy because we're gonna put it all on film. So can you leave a space in front? You need to leave a space in front so the camera can film. And, and our camera people, can you, can you give us instructions on how to uh, set it up best? I think I should get mine. Yeah, and just get a close-up. That, that would probably be the best. So don't stand right in front of the camera. And then make sure you can see and hear what Amy is doing. And we're going to test the pitch of the open string. So this is the microphone right here and make sure it's close enough. What does it say? G? Oh, e. It's E. Let's do it again, make sure everybody believes this. Okay, and if you see two red lights on it, that means it's right on the right pitch. It's not sharp and it's not flat. So this is E. Now, the whole length is 66 centimeters. We want to hear the first overtone I didn't explain the difference between harmonic and overtone. I said they're about the same, but actually we count the fundamental frequency as the first harmonic. Then the next one up is the second harmonic and so forth. But with overtones, we say fundamental frequency, first overtone. So overtone will always be one less, one less than a harmonic. Harmonic is the fundamental frequency. So harmonic or fundamental frequency. Harmonic, first harmonic, fundamental frequency. Second harmonic, then you first overtone. Third harmonic, then you second overtone. Just so you know there's a difference in usage. It doesn't really matter, but it's good to keep it straight. So that was our first harmonic, our fundamental frequency. Now we want to hear the first overtone. In order to hear an overtone, when it's vibrating like this, let's look. Where is the largest movement on the string? In the middle, right? The middle goes up and down the longest distance, the ends, it goes up and down less. If we want to cut it in half, if we don't want to hear this fundamental frequency, we can suppress it by putting our finger right on the node. That's called the node, the place where it travels the farthest, that's the node. If we very lightly touch it with our finger, 
we're not going to hear the fundamental frequency because we suppressed it. What we will hear is what? We're going to hear the first overtone or the second harmonic, right? So we're just suppressing so we don't hear that fundamental frequency. That way we will be able to hear the tone that was there anyway. We couldn't hear it though because the fundamental frequency was too loud. It was drowning everything out. But if we take away just that note, then we can hear the other ones. But we won't hear these clearly because number two is louder than three, four, five. So one at a time, we're going to be able to move one overtime, uh, overtone up at a time, okay? So let's try it. First of all, it was 66 centimeters. Let's measure to 33 centimeters. It's going to be right at a fret. All right, that's your fret. Now, if you strum the string, then touch it very lightly with your finger. Or you can touch it first and then strum. Touch it very lightly. Okay, I'll show you how to do it and then you'll be able to do it after this. This is the fret. So listen carefully, everyone. Oops. Do you hear an octave? That octave is the first overtone. That's what we couldn't hear because the fundamental is too loud. So practice and see if you can do harmonics. Okay, and then hold, touch it lightly and then strum. There, got it. Can you hear? Dum, dum. Now we want to know if it really is an octave. It should still register as an E. Do we have an E? We got an E. Does, ever, does anybody need to see it to believe it? You need to play it again. Okay, touch it before you play. There. Did we get an E? All right, so we've got one octave up. We cut it in half. Remember, octaves are, you multiply by two and you get an octave. Now, what do we want to do? We want to suppress, we want to suppress some of the other overtones. We want to, we want a node to be right, or we want an, uh, we want an anti-node to be right here, right? I forget which is which now. No, that should be a note. We want to touch it here so that it's going to, we're going to hear the part that's divided into thirds. So if we touch it here, we're going to suppress this and that. But we will hear this because it's right in the place where it's not really moving. We're going to be able to hear clearly just the seven z e to nega overtone. Okay? So how do we get seven z? The whole thing is 66 me uh, centimeters. 22. So let's measure 22. You can measure from the top. Now, what are we supposed to get? What note are we supposed to get? Let's go back to our page so we know what note we're going after. Okay, see here? We've got 66 centimeters. We heard that. 33 centimeters. We heard the octave. The next one up is going to be an octave plus a fifth. So if we start on E, 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 then we have to go up a fifth. E, 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 e. That's supposed to be a B. Okay, that's a fifth up from E. So let's touch it and produce a harmonic at the one third point and see if we get a B. Okay? Okay, look, what are we getting? B. We got a B. That is the one third harmonic. Okay, it's better to touch it first than play. We get a better, a better overtone. Lightly. There we go. Is it B? We got a B. All right. So now you're starting to believe me, right? <laughs> After the B, what are we going to get? What's the next one up? This is the third harmonic, the second overtone. The fourth harmonic or third overtone will be one quarter of the length. Let's just go back just to remind ourselves what it looks like, although you all know what a quarter looks like. Okay, we're going to go to this one here, right? When we get to the quarter, then we have to take 66 and divide it by 4. And that's harder, isn't it? So let's just make sure it's right. 66 divided by 4. <laughs> that's correct? All right. Everybody needs to, we always need to check our math. So that means that if we measure and go to the 16.5 centimeter point, that will be Then we should be able to get the fourth harmonic. Let's try it. So measure 16.5 from the top and touch it lightly and then 
plug the string. What did we get? E. We got an E. There we go. So now we're two octaves up. We went up one octave, we went another octave up. We're going to try just one more. We're going to push the, uh, push the boundaries here a little bit, push the envelope. The next one will be Uven Z E, and that should be two octaves. We're already at the two octave place, plus a third. So it's dum dum dum. It's supposed to go up a third. It's getting pretty high there. That should be a G. Okay? The only problem is, look here. You need to look at something here. Um, remember I told you that the Ping Jun Lu does not really agree with the Zi Ran Lu. And you will see that here. With Ping Jun Lu, a G at this point should be how much? 415.305 hertz. That's what it should be, according to Ping Jun Lu. That way we've evened everything out, the intervals are all perfectly equal. But with Zi Ran Lu, this is what we get. Is it higher or lower? It's lower. Now you see an example of what I was trying to say in class but couldn't easily explain. The Ping Jun Lu puts it up higher so that it's the right distance, it's the same distance from the other notes, from the other intervals. But if we just go by Zi Ran Lu, this note would be 410. And that's why it's not going to fall right on the fret. So measure it. If you touch the fret, you will get the Ping Jun Lu note. If you, uh, if you touch the fret. But if you go by the measurement, you should get the Zi Ran Lu note. And the Zi Ran Lu will resonate. If you use the Ping Jun Lu, it will not Okay, try again. There we go. What did we get? G sharp. Did you see a little green light go on? That means it's sharp or, or flat, is it? I'm sorry. Sharp. Sharp, yeah. Okay. So it's a little bit off. But we got the other harmonic. All right, how do we get those harmonics? We're suppressing the louder ones so we can hear the quieter ones. All clear? <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Yumi. Thank you. Thank you, Bella. Good. Thank you. All right. Is everybody convinced? You're smiling, Yumi. So, so big. What's, what are you thinking? Um, I always think about overtone is I always mix with the fundamental frequency that I can't separate it. And that's I use uh, uh, electric, electric uh, software or this computer and I can figure out. I don't think I can use guitar to figure out. But now, but now you know you can do it. Because when we do things on the computer, somebody maybe they just designed the software to, to fool you. But that is, this is the, the, the natural world. It actually is that way. It's exciting when it really works. We don't expect it to, and then it works. It came out really well. You did a good job on the tuner. So we know this much. Now this page should all be clear. Did you? Play around with the frequency analyzer. Last time I told you about the software. Did you play around with the frequency analyzer software? Remember the one that had the colored lines? Notes. Put it in your notes. Do it before next time. Have some fun with it. I'm not going to do it again because we've already seen that once. Um, that covers this page. We're going to go on to the next page. Now, what we have just seen demonstrated and heard demonstrated, we're going to call the source. The source. Lai Tou, Lai Yuan. You need to know this because Professor Johnson is going to talk about it in the book, right at the beginning of chapter 8. Because we have a model of how sound works in human speech, and it's called the source filter model. First of all, you need to understand what the source is. We're going to go on to the filter now, but you have to really understand what the source is. The source is a fundamental frequency, which at the same time is emitting many overtones. That's the source. right? That is our source. So it's a tone that our ear hears as the actual pitch, it's all those tones above it that are related to it 
in a very, very tidy, Hanjunyuan way, evenly distributed. That's our source. This is the source, this is the source sound that our vocal folds are sending up to our vocal tract. So our vocal folds are like the guitar string, not perfectly, but good enough. The analogy is a very good one. When they're opening and closing, they've also, just like a manyu, they've got all these little parts that are, that are uh, experiencing their own mode and rate of vibration. Our vocal folds are doing just what the guitar string did. That's our source. So it's sending up the fundamental frequency, all these overtones. It's sending this yuan liao up to the vocal tract. That's our start. That's what we call the, again, source. All right, we're speaking American, so we won't mix it up with jiang liao because source in British is the same as jiang liao, source and source, right? Source on your potatoes or source means the beginning of something. All right, so in American, we keep it clear. Here is the next web page, page nine. Bowels informants, one, resonance. Resonance in Chinese is gong ming, gong ming. This is already the beginning of the filter because we're going to take this yuan liao and we're going to jia gong chu li. That's what the vocal tract does. Ba zi ge yuan lai de zi ge sheng yi jia gong chu li. It's going to change. We have already learned about fundamental frequency and harmonics or overtones. The next step to understanding vowels is to learn about formants. Resonance is gong ming, formants is gong zhen feng. We know that. So the gong ming, the thing of gong is the a gong. We know that all voice sounds have a fundamental frequency, that is, the number of times the vocal folds vibrate per second. And we know that in addition to this fundamental frequency, are a theoretically infinite number of harmonics or overtones or frequencies that are multiples of the fundamental frequency. These overtones decrease in amplitude the higher their frequency. So, Loudness decreases by about six decibels for each successive musical octave. We'll talk about decibels later, but you can first, you can first take a look. Every time you get to a bass note, the volume will be reduced by six decibels. You can put that in your notes, because that's useful. We're going to need that in the future. Even though you don't understand about the volume and other things yet, probably. You can first take a look. So every octave, every time you get to a bass note, it's not every overtone. Because it's not every overtone that will reduce by six decibels for each octave, right? 所以每个八度音，整个音量会降低六分贝。Okay, so far we understand 100%, right? If it's not 100%, tell me because I want everything to be absolutely clear. Because as soon as we get into physics, it's not like with with wind, the you know, 你有一些东西没有听懂 They were probably just 很很花俏的一个描述 Doesn't matter, right? But with physics, every single bit, every single Bit or step is essential. Okay. Sure. Okay. We're going to describe it in these two pages. So this is just the beginning. That is going to be the filter. When we get to that, we're going to be describing the filter, what the vocal tract is doing to the signal that's coming up. So we will explain it. That's sort of the point that we're leading up to. However, when producing vowels and other voice sounds, some of the overtone frequencies are louder or more prominent to our ears than others. It's as though the volume is turned up on frequencies within certain ranges. What causes this? So if we have a signal um, that has a fundamental frequency of 100 hertz, we know we've got 100, 200, 300, 400 going up here, right? 从这里送到这里来。But when we do things with our tongue and other parts of our vocal tract, it's going to dull some of the frequencies. Just like on the guitar, if we actually touched on a harmonic, but if we moved our finger just a little bit, it was Do we need to demonstrate it or is everybody already okay with me? 
are okay on this. 都可以嘛，不需要表演了。All right. So if you're right on the frequency, it's gonna go. It rings. But if you leave that frequency, and it's not on a harmonic, 你刚好没有按到该有 harmonic 的地方，或者是比较响亮的 harmonic, it'll go. Dum, dum, dum. So when the signal goes up into our vocal tract, there are certain spaces in our. Start listening now, because this will explain some of it. There are certain spaces that have a certain frequency, and when the free, they match the frequency of the signal. That frequency is going to be 很响亮，就好像按到了他那个 harmonic 在吉他上。It will go， 嗯，因为他碰到口腔的那个地方的时候，就刚好是他自己自然的那个频率。他进入那个空间，那个空间自己也有个自然的频率。That's what we're going to demonstrate now. So if it's not clear, it should be soon. Try blowing. I didn't bring over a soda bottle. I didn't want. I already had a lot of stuff with the guitar, so I'm just going to do it on the on the internet. Or on the on the web page here, you can do it at home if you like. But you will see the demonstration, and it's I think it's pretty clear. So you take a soda bottle and you blow over it. It goes, ooh, ooh, right. Then、uh, it will correspond to the natural frequency of the air inside the bottle. Now this is important. The bottle is empty. It has a certain frequency. 完全空的是那个空气在那个空间里震动的那个速率。That's its natural frequency. Does anybody have a water bottle? Not a bottle. If you're not using plastic, good for you. Because I don't either. I use I use this. You can't do it really with this. That's okay. A bottle like that, we're not going to dump it all out. I just didn't want to bring all that stuff. I could have, but we will see it demonstrated on the internet. You don't have to drink up because this doesn't work. Not so shippy shing. All right. So if you have a bottle and you blow over it, if it's empty, you've done it before. You've all played with bottle blowing, right? Ooh, ooh. The reason we get that pitch is because when you're blowing in air, you're making the air vibrate. And one of the frequencies in your blowing, if you blow it just right, is matching the frequency of the air in the space of that bottle. 那个瓶子本身有一个它自己天然的一个的一个频率，它就是它空的，完全是空气在里面。刚好那个空间的大小跟形状，你吹的话，它会以它自己天然、它自然的那个 frequency 去震动。That's why we hear the woo woo woo. However, if we add water into the bottle, what's going to happen to the pitch? It's going to become higher because the space occupied by the air becomes smaller. And that means it's going to have a lower, a higher frequency. It's going to have a higher pitch and a higher frequency. So from ooh ooh, it'll go ooh ooh, or something like that. That wasn't a good note for me. Ooh 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 ooh. If we put more water in, ooh ooh, it'll go higher. Okay.、Um, the bottle is a resonating chamber. This note corresponds to the natural frequency of the air inside the bottle. If you add water, the air space in the bottle will become smaller, and you will hear a higher note when you blow over the bottle again. On the other hand, if you strike the bottle, something different will happen. If the bottle is empty and you tap the bottle, what will happen? You're going to get a pretty high pitch. After you add some water and you tap the bottom of the bottle, it will go lower and then lower because what frequency are we getting? The frequency of the water vibrating. So as we get more and more water in there, the pitch will get lower and lower. But if we blow the bottle, the pitch will get higher and higher. That is resonance. Resonance. So the 共鸣就是这样子 That means we're exciting it at exactly the frequency,、uh, at exactly its natural frequency. You guys are not sure. Exactly at its natural frequency, we're giving it excitation, either by tapping or by blowing. Blowing affects the air. Tapping affects the water. We make it resonate. That's resonance. So, he, 吹的时候他很响亮，他很高兴。这刚好是他喜欢的频率。All right. For a virtual demonstration, visit this site and then try producing the sounds from the three jugs. They used to have a wonderful animation. 你可以按吹或者按敲 ，but they Modernized their site and got rid of all the wonderful old stuff. So we can listen to it and we can look at 
a different site that has pictures. So this is the modernized version, and they don't have the old one up, unfortunately. It's called Jug Band Physics. Pictures are gone. It's just Wenzi. They don't even have the audio, but I saved the audio from Anianqian. They did keep the audio online. So we can listen to that. It's right here. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> that was hard to get. <laughs> okay. So, everyone's clear on what's going on. Okay. He added a good part in the explanation that I think makes it clearer why it works, the, a physical explanation. When you start adding water and then you tap the bottle, what happens? Why does it go lower? What explanation did he give? As you put more and more water into the bottle, the bottle is getting heavier, right? And it's hard for the vibrations produced by our sound and transmitted by the sound of our voice or by a tap or anything, it gets harder for them to move something that's heavier. The heavier it gets, the harder it is to push it into vibration. The harder it is to push into vibration, that means the vibration is going to be faster or slower. And if the vibration is slower, the pitch is going to go. So that's a purely physical reason. Just by looking at how heavy it is, you know it's going to vibrate slower. All right? So when it's empty, then of course it's easy to vibrate fast because there's nothing heavy to push. And that should make that a lot clearer, you know, just in very, very solid, concrete, physical terms. You can imagine the vocal tract as a series of soda bottles or cavities with different shapes and sizes. We're now relating this physical demonstration or set of demonstrations to the vocal tract. What happens inside around from here to here? It's like a series of soda bottles. I don't want to talk about qi shui. I don't even like talking about it. All right. So they have different shapes and different sizes, and they're all connected together. And the source signal is going through them to come out to the outside air. As it goes through them, it's going to have its pitch. It has all those pitches there. They all, the pitches are all there from 100, 200, 300, all the way up. They stay there. But some parts of the vocal tract have a shape with a natural frequency that corresponds to one of the overtones that you're producing. So let's say that this space in the, in the vocal tract, our, our pitch again is 100 hertz. One of, the, one of the overtones is 300 hertz. And we've got a space in the vocal tract that vibrates exactly at 300 hertz. So when these, this series of vibrations from the vocal folds opening and closing goes through that space, it's like tapping on the bottle. So it's going to make it sound at a certain pitch. Fundamental frequency, 100 hertz, is loud. We all hear it as the pitch. The source is 100 plus overtones. Natural frequency. No. Woman just because that's our fundamental frequency. Because it's very happy going through that space. space Got it? Amy clear? Yeah? You had science before, right, or not? Yeah, some I remember. The rest of you? Tina? Sort of clear? Whoever understood me pretty well, can you please explain it one more time in Chinese? 
we have to go through this every semester, right? 一个一个关卡是那个，就是上一次讲的那个 overtones。那现在从 overtones 我们要跳到 resonance and filter. So whoever understood what I said, more or less, can you tell it again in Chinese? And if you're not quite right, I will correct you. 有没有人可以讲 ？Okay, let me just say it one more time. We're going to have more demonstrations that will make it clear, just like the other demonstrations did. We have a source. Its loudest pitch is 100 hertz, but it's got a series of increasingly softer pitches that are multiples of 100, which are 200, 400. So they're all coming up at the same time. So that means we're sending out vibrations at all of these frequencies at the same time. 100 is the most powerful. 200 is pretty strong. 300 is less strong. 400 still less strong. But they're still exciting the different spaces in our vocal tract. Now we have a space here above your tongue, below your tongue, between your lips and your tongue is another space. It's probably one of the bases of F3. You know, the one that's close to your vocal folds, the one that's closer to your mouth. Those are all different spaces. We're calling them formants. 可是有大大小小的各式各样的不同形状的一些空间，在你的舌头在移动的时候，它自己就会造成很多的空的一些空间 ，right? 每一个那个空的空间，它自己有一个自然会震动的一个频率，每一个都有。So if my hands are like this, that's one. I make them smaller, it goes higher. So this one has a natural frequency; it's lower than this one. So when the signal goes through this one, 它刚好它喜欢的那个频率，它它自己会震动的那个频率就是三百。那个三百的那个 overtone 进去了，它就会嗯 ，That's my frequency。另外一个空间可能比它小，它喜欢震动的速率可能是七百，所以七百也会使它震动。可是它会很高，然后声音比较小，它可能是这样子，嗯，这里是嗯嗯 ，And they all go together. It's like playing a chord， 好像个和弦一样。Okay, that's all clear. Let's just finish this, and you'll get your break, so we know what's going on here. Now, our vocal tract is like a series of soda bottles. 就是很多连在一起的不同大小、不同形状的空间连在一起 Each cavity in the vocal tract will respond to vibrations, the fundamental frequency plus harmonics coming from the vocal folds by vibrating at the cavity's own natural. Frequency. Okay, so we've got the signal coming up, fundamental frequency plus harmonics coming from the vocal folds. Each cavity is going to vibrate at its own rate. It will be excited by one of the overtones or a couple of the overtones. The frequencies strengthened by resonances in the vocal tract sound louder than the ones without. So, 一百本来就大声，三百刚好有个空间有三百这个频率。两百就没怎样，我们听不到两百有什么特别。可是三百会很响亮，七百又很响亮，其他的就没什么。因为看它的空间，它自己自然的那个震动的那个频率，它就会加强这个 signal， 这个 source signal 里面的某一些 overtones。That's the biggest thing. That's the hardest part. If you got that, we're in free. 剩下的就不会难。If you understood this. So that's filter. Uh, sorry, source and filter. Source and filter. Which one has more information? Which one has more stuff in it? The source has tons of stuff, but the filter just picks out some of the some of the stuff that it likes, and it ignores the rest. Now, there's one thing I have to clarify. It doesn't really, really, really strengthen the strength in the volume. It doesn't really strengthen. It just doesn't make it lower down. It doesn't make it lower down. 没有那个空间，有那么那这样子一个频率的空间的话，它就等于压抑了那个 overtone。其他的就让它充分的发挥。Okay, so it doesn't really add volume because unless we add more energy in the system, we can't produce more energy. All it can do is strengthen. It can just sort of let us hear more clearly what's already there and suppress what it doesn't want you to hear, what is not there. Okay. The vibrations from the vocal folds act like the airstream you blow over the bottle. 
，从你的那个声带那个发出的那个讯号，就好像你吹那个瓶子的时候的那个 airstream 一样。The frequencies strengthened by resonances in the vocal tract sound louder than the ones without. That is enough for a start. Continue on to the next page when you're ready. You'll see an amazing demonstration of how resonances in the human vocal tract produce the familiar vowels a, e, a, o, u, and all the other vowels as well. Okay, we finished the page. Break time. Okay, we're gonna go back now, and this is going to be another 很有震撼力的一个 demonstration. I mean, this is really amazing. Every year after students see it, they just go, oh, and they tell everybody about it because. So far, we don't really know what a vowel is. We don't know how we produce a vowel. We've learned formants. We've learned about long and short. We've learned about all kinds of stuff about vowels, but we don't really know how vowels are produced. But this will show you how it's done, based on what we know so far. On the previous page, we learned about how a sound source can make a resonator vibrate and strengthen selected frequencies of the original sound. Make sure you understand that sentence before we continue. It's repeating. It's sort of summing up what we just talked about. A sound source can make a resonator, that space, one of those spaces I was talking about, vibrate. For example, this one likes 300. This one likes 700. And strengthen selected frequencies of the original sound. So the 300 sounds really 响亮 but the 200 gets no attention. So we don't hear the 200 very well. That's what this sentence is sort of repeating. Okay, you can do another easy and fun experiment to show yourself how this works. Play a note on a piano or guitar string. After the sound has died out, sing the same note out loud. So we have another demonstration. Do we have a new guitarist? Does someone else want to take over the guitar? We still have the guitar here, so it doesn't matter. You don't. 不需要会弹 just pluck. That's all. Who wants? Who would like to do the guitar? 浪费时间 Go ahead, Annie. All right, let's read the instructions. Go ahead, you can sit there and get ready. We play a note on the piano or guitar string. We don't have a piano here. We're going to use the guitar string. After the sound has died out, so it'll go dong, and then slowly it decays. We call that decay. Decay means 腐烂 but it means for a sound to slowly get softer and softer, and then we don't hear it anymore. That's decay. So we play a sound, we let it die out. That's so we know which pitch we want to sing, to try and excite that string with our voice instead of with our thumbnail. Do we follow what we're talking about? Do you follow what I'm talking about? So we're going to play a string, let it finish vibrating, and then we're going to try singing at the guitar. And if we have the same frequency that that note produces when we strum it. What should happen? It'll go、mm, all by itself without touching it. All right? Have you seen that happen before? All right. Well, we're gonna do it anyway. What the heck? <laughs> It's pretty. And then we can we could also measure the、um, frequency if we want to with the tuner. So all you have to do pick a note that who wants to sing? Who's not shy about singing? We, you want to help us? Yeah, can you help us? No, Sophie's our best singer here. No, <laughs> hands down, no doubt about it. So let's pick a pick a nice note that you like. Find one that you like. Have, have Sophie find find one. That's a good one. All right. So get ready.、Uh, you play it pretty hard. And then after it died out, you sing that same note, but you have to sing it at the guitar, pretty loud. Get pretty close. Why don't you come over here and get pretty close? Okay. Now wait till it's done. You have to get close to the guitar. Let's get close to the guitar again, so you can hear it. Everybody. So. Sing ah, sing ah. Okay, stop. You have to like shout at it. You have to shout the note <laughs> right at the string, and you will hear. I heard some resonance. Yeah, I heard it. I heard some resonance, but we need a little more. Okay. 
So get close and kind of shout. That was a really clear hum, wasn't it? It was a very clear hum. Thank you so much, Sophie and Annie. So if we produce a vibration that's right at the same natural vibration of any kind of a body, of air, a string, of anything, if it's right at that same frequency, it's going to hum just like this, right? That's what happens in our vocal tract. When one of those overtones hits that note that that space likes, it's going to make it hum, just like that. Now clear? Okay. So let's go over this, make sure we got it. After the sound has died out, sing the same note out loud. Ah is good because your mouth is open and it's got much more volume. You will hear and see if you look. If you look at it, you can also see it vibrating. The piano or guitar string vibrating and producing a note without your having touched it or struck a piano key at all. The vibrations from your singing move the air at just the natural frequency of the string and set it into motion. Okay? Now it's all clear, right? Let's go on. The cavities of your vocal tract change in shape and volume as you move your articulatory organs to speak. When you're moving your tongue around, if it's like an E, part of your tongue is high up and there's a space back here. If it's an A, ah, then you've got a big space here, right? If it's an U, you've got the tongue close to the velum here and we've got a bunch of space here. All of those spaces start humming as soon as the source signal hits them. And then their, their frequency keeps changing because the size of the space changes. So as long as we stay on ooh, this space will stay the same and it will resonate at the same frequency. But as soon as we move our tongue, e, then that space has changed and then the humming part changes as well. And the note will change. So it's like we have constantly changing xian chords humming in our vocal tract as we are speaking. Klima? All right. We're mainly interested in three spaces. Okay, the cavities of your vocal tract change in shape and volume as you move your articulatory organs to speak. That means that their resonance frequencies will be constantly changing. The space gets bigger, the space gets smaller, the shape changes, it's going to have a different frequency. These different resonant frequencies are called formants. So each space or set of spaces, its size, its natural frequency, there, we were concerned about the first three, F1, F2, F3. Those are the formants because each one will have a certain frequency at which it resonates. So when the signal comes up from the vocal folds, when we do an U, this one will resonate. When we do an E, a different one will resonate at a different pitch. Are we okay? Yeah? Vivian okay? All right. So these are called formants. That is what a gongzhen feng is. We've been talking about it all this time. Last semester I said, well, we're going to call it a formant, but I don't have time to tell you what it is. Now do you know how much explanation it would have taken to explain what a formant was last semester? A lot, right? And a guitar, and a tuner. <laughs> and a measuring tape and everything. Formants show up on a spectrogram as the thick black bands you see superimposed on the overtones of a speech sound. So if you just look in your textbook, I don't think I even have my textbook out. It must still be in my bag. Goodness, what's Okay, let's just swipe and pick a spectrogram. Look on page 194. Do you see those dark bands? Those mark formants one, two, and three. And we did talk about those last semester, but we didn't really know what they were. Now we know what they are. Those are the areas that resonate 
in response to the signal being sent up based on their particular size and shape. Formants show up on a spectrogram as the thick black bands you see superimposed on the overtones of a speech sound. Remember to use a narrow band spectrogram to see overtones clearly. You have spectrogram. One is narrow band, one is broad band. And very quickly I'll explain the main difference, but it'll take a lot of explaining to explain more theory about them. But never mind. If you just want to see overtones, use a narrow band spectrogram. That will show you those stripes really clearly. Remember like last class? We saw those lines really clearly, right? That was a narrow band spectrogram. But if you want to see actual pitch really clearly and the formants really, if you want to see the big bands of formants and you want to see pitches, just go bit of pitch, then you use a broadband formant. Oh, time, actually. The main thing we need broadband for is time. 时间上,那个变化很快的时候,一定要用 broadband. Okay? So narrow band is to see the overtones clearly. Broadband is to see changes in time clearly. 因为变化很快. 所以那个broadband会让你看每一个pulse的呈现. The problem with broadbands is you don't see the overtones very clearly, 很模糊, 可是直的那个横,就是直轴,那个方向,一条一条都很分明,可是横的蛮模糊,横的模糊直的还蛮清楚,直的是时间,横的是那个overtones那些东西。so that's why broadband is really good for seeing differences, changes over time. And you can also see the, you can see the formants, but they're 都都模糊在一起了. 其实formants不是真的那么粗黑的一条,中间你会看到一条一条的 overtones, 如果你用narrowband的话. Do you want to see the difference? Let's find a page with a narrowband, and then you'll know what I'm talking about. They don't have many of them because we don't use narrow band spectrograms that often because we're usually more interested in changes over time. We want to see the rapid changes in the signal. Okay, look on page 210. Figure 8.16, the one below, the one at the bottom. It's the top half of the page, but it's the one below the top figure. Okay, this is what it should look like, page 210, right down here. Compare this one with this one. Can you see those overtone bands, those overtone stripes? 上面是不是那个formants都是粗黑的模糊在一起,可是下面有没有觉得那一条一条的一条一条的条文好清楚? So this is the one that shows the overtones clearly. 横的那个, what would we say, orientation. You can see the overtones clearly. 如果是 broadband, you see the vertical pulses clearly, and that shows changes over time. Does that make that part clear? The difference between, yeah. Yeah, those 细的,下面的,上面的你根本就看不到。下面的那个,这里的,这一条一条一条, those are the overtones. Do y'all see them here? 这个一条一条的都很清楚,听到没有, okay? 对对对对,那个细的,一条一条的,细的一条一条的是 overtones. Anybody need me to point it out? If you're not quite sure, good. Just ask. You can't tell the detail, detail, detail. Those are the overtones. That's right, and they look sharp here. But here we can't see them at all. We see the formants. They're blurred together. But here the overtones are all very thin. So you see it, and then the two of you, you know, right? So no problem. Those are the overtones. They're blurred together in the broadband. Okay, and our auditor too. These are the overtones, yeah, and they're blurred together in the broadband. Okay, the two of you? So, each individual stripe is an overtone. They're all blurred together in the broadband. We can see the formants, but they blur the overtones together. It has the overtones go to the, because it comes to a good bit of overtone, a narrow band type kind of swallow. Is the one on the Resonance, but all the overtones are still... Just plain overtones. Right. They don't have anything strengthening them, making them shang liang. That's right. 
That's right, that's right. They're not being strengthened, but they're there. But they're going to be overwhelmed by, by the performance. That's right, okay? So, Sophie? All right, just uh, page one, uh, 210. Page 210. These are the overtones, the stripes. And when it gets really dark, those are the formants. So the formants blur all the overtones together. Actually, they're there, but they're all blurred together. But here, each overtone has bending. And here, we've got a formant. That's why it's so dark. OK? Anybody else need anything pointed out or explained? Kaima? Yeah. That's right. Kayuga Fan Wei. The center frequency is going to be the most powerful. That's called the center frequency. And if you're interested, we'll get into it. Not right now, though. We've got a lot of information going. As long as you understand how it works. It has sort of like a bell curve of damping. And I can tell you one more thing. I don't know if you'll get it, but I'll just throw it out there, and we may come back to it in the future. If something has a very, hmm, let's say, like a tuning fork. When you hit a tuning fork, I didn't bring one today, it goes ping, and it lasts a very long time. Right, in ta exactly, a tuning fork. However, every object has a natural frequency, but let's say this desktop. So let's pay shot. See if you can hear a musical pitch of some kind. So it does have a pitch, that means it's only one note. But this one is giving us several notes, and it doesn't really care that much about any of the notes. So <laughs> so just remember that. That makes it easy to remember, doesn't it? <笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑> oh, he gets so excited. <laughs> That's really true. Now you've understood a lot. So you're going to see different shaped curves that will describe the decay of the sound. If it is a sound like this, it will, it will just decay very quickly. But if it's very, very carefully tuned or very tuned to just one note, so you'll hear that resonance going on for quite a while. All right, now, remember to use a narrow band spectrogram to see overtones clearly. It is these form and patterns that create different vowel qualities. It's pulling all of these different pitches of F1, F2, F3, etc. but really etc. doesn't matter. It's only F1, F2, F3 that matter. Because after F, starting with F4, but it doesn't really tell you anything about the language. It tells you more stuff about your head and about other things. So it's really only F1, F2, F3 that give us information about the vowel. So it's like a three-note chord. Now, you're still not so sure about this. It may be a little hard to visualize. But you can see how this works in actual practice with the following remarkable demonstration from the Exploratorium Science Museum of San Francisco. 
I went to San Francisco in 2005 for an Imbira workshop, African Thumb Piano, and I had one day at the end of the workshop before I flew back, and I was going to go to the Exploratorium and see this exhibit. But that day was Monday. Oh. So I Mayo Yuan Chi Exploratorium, but they do amazing things. If you go to San Francisco, don't do it on a Monday. <laughs> go to the Exploratorium. They have amazing exhibits, and I'm so thankful to them for this one because this one really helps us understand vowels. Um, it starts with a sound source. For their sound source, they don't use human vocal folds and a, a, a sound made from them. They use a duck call. Now, I have a duck call at home. I should have thought to bring it. But when you blow on it, it goes, it sounds sort of like that. It, it makes a sound like that. We'll hear a demonstration in a minute. We're going to use that for the vocal folds. In fact, if you don't have the vocal fold or the vocal tract above it, the sound of the vocal folds just vibrating, do you know what it sounds like? I'm going to demonstrate. It goes, that's what it sounds like. It's shocking because our voice is something humans like. We love the human voice, right? We feel very chin chin and we understand language. But if we didn't have the vocal tract up here giving us those different formants, we would hear a duck call. That's all we would hear. We're right in the heat of the thing. I mean, finding out what a vowel is, we gotta find out. Okay, any comments or questions before we continue? Are you all with me? Everyone's with me, right? All right, exciting stuff coming up, promise you. It's been pretty exciting so far, right? More stuff coming, all right. So, this may be a little hard to visualize, but we're gonna use this demonstration from the Exploratorium in San Francisco. It starts with a sound source. In this case, we're not using the human vocal folds as a sound source. It's a duck call. That's how it sounds. And it's really like your vocal folds vibrating to make a sound. Over this vibrating sound source, you add plastic tubes modeled after the vocal tract when it's making one of the five vowels. So I'm going to jump ahead and show you some MRI images of the vocal tract while it is making different vowels. And it's right here. MRI, there's explanations on the internet if you need them. All right? If you take an MRI of the vocal tract, these are male, these are female, female ones are gonna be smaller. These are the different vowels. This is what the vocal tract looks like when you're making the different vowels. So you can see with, with E, this part is very small, remember? F2 is very small with E. You can see that right here. That's F2. And F1 is going to be bigger. And there's E, I, A, A, A. And some of them I'm not sure, even how you know the IPA, but we will know when we hear them. And then ow, u, u. And I'm not sure about them. They look like they're repeating, but we will find out when we hear the other demonstration. Okay? So we're going to go to Exploratorium. We better change, we better just close this down. Too much stuff here. All right, vocal vowels. Hollow plastic models of the human vocal tract turn the squawk of a duck call into vowel sounds. To do a notice, here is the sound source. It's really a, a repackaged duck call. Notice the reed above. It's a reed here. Notice the reed above the curved wooden surface, surface, that's this. Air blows past the reed from right to left, it's coming in here, and it's going to excite this reed, causing it to vibrate and produce a buzzing sound. <laughs> that's how it sounds. <laughs> that's a duck call. Now, this sound that you hear is made by the reed as it vibrates. 
clicking. We're going to click on the following pictures. These are modeled after these MRI images of the vocal tract making different vowels. We're going to model it using plastic tubes. This is for ah. So here we've got the duck call is here. They're blowing in that sound. It's going to go in here. And we're going to see how it sounds after it goes through those tubes, those different shaped tubes. All right. Ah. Ah. It sounds like ah, right? Let's try this one. Mm. We'll try to do it. But the problem is sometimes they say, oh, this will, this will work. Okay. The next one should be E. Manshamba. <laughs> Okay, and remember that um, E has got that and she she the ego ego F two. And now we're going to this one. A A. And this is for O. Okay, just by changing the size and shape of the tubes that we pull together. And then here we've got, should be ooh. Okay, kaima, manshamba. So, we've got the source, we've got that duck call vibration coming in, and then we change the size and shape of the chambers that it's going through. And it's going to accentuate some frequencies and suppress other ones, ignore other ones. So, F1, frequency. F2, F1, F2, F3, F3, Wow! Isn't that something? That's a vowel. It's three spaces with different resonating frequencies sounded together at the same time by the vocal folds making a fundamental frequency with a bunch of overtones. It picks the ones it likes and it sounds those three notes and there's our vowel. Yeah? Cool? All right, now, okay, now you've been initiated. You've been initiated. Now you know something almost nobody in the Y when she knows. All of them are studying all kinds of languages, but most of them do not know this. How the stuff that they are producing to make language is made, or what causes the sound to be as it is. Right? This is the coolest thing in the world, yeah. You can, you can. If you put them together and excite them, yeah, you can do that. In fact, you can do it with a computer. You can do it with actual plastic models, but it's easier to just put numbers into a computer. That's easier. And compare the shapes inside these models with the pictures shown below. Each picture shows the shape of your vocal tract when you say a different vowel. We've reproduced the plastic models next to the diagram for your convenience. Note that while the plastic models are straight, the vocal tract is bent almost 90 degrees in the middle. So from here to here, we've got a 90 degree angle. But it doesn't matter if you bend. If you have a pipe and you're blowing through it, you will get the same frequency if you bend it. Because you know like it doesn't matter. As long as it's the same length and the same size. So these are the same things that we've just heard. Okay, and they just let you they just let you see the plastic tube. So you can see this, and then there's the F2. For E, remember, the F2 is very small. For E, or A here, this is about the Bili. For O, it's a high uh, middle back vowel, so 它的比例大概是这样子. F2 is quite big, so it has a low pitch. 
in contrast to F uh, to E. Okay, and then sorry. All right, ooh. This was O. Oh, ooh. Okay? So that's how it works. What's going on? The chamber of each plastic model is shaped like your vocal tract. The cavity formed by your mouth and throat when you speak, each time you say a different vowel, you change the shape of your vocal tract. That's why each model is a little different from the others. The plastic chambers uh, pictures are aligned similar to your vocal tract with a vocal, with a vocal cords duct call at the bottom and the lips at the top. At this exhibit, a puff of air from a bellows. What's a bellows? What's it in Chinese? In Gu Dai de Shaho, Nega Huo. Feng Xiang, it's a Feng Xiang, that's it. They have a Feng Xiang, they have a bellows there that you can operate. You push a puff of air into the models and then they make those sounds. Um, a, a puff of air from a bellows makes the duck call. I don't know if you do it by hand, because I didn't get there, like I said, but in any case, it's a bellows. Uh, makes the duck call read at the end of a hose vibrate, just as the air from your lungs makes your vocal cords vibrate. Like your vocal cords, the vibrating reed produces a complex sound. Remember, it's a complex sound, unlike, unlike whistling, which is not a complex sound. It's a very simple sound. Our voice produces a complex sound, meaning it has many, many overtones. Right. If it produces a lot of overtones, it's a complex sound. If it doesn't, it's just a fundamental frequency. It's a simple sound. That's the difference. So um, this uh, duck call read at the end of the hose vibrates, just as the air from your lungs makes your vocal cords vibrate. Like your vocal cords, the vibrating reed produces a complex sound composed of many different pitches, many different overtones. Like your vocal tract, the plastic models shape these complex sounds into particular vowel sounds. When a complex sound echoes from the walls of the plastic cavity, some pitches are reinforced. And some are not. It is the reinforcement and cancellation of certain pitches. We'll, we'll go into that another time. That changes the squawk of the duck call into a recognizable vowel sound. But then it turns into a vowel that sounds like human speech. And the exhibit now wants to say goodbye to you. Okay. And that's the end of the exploratorium visit. Okay. If you want to do this yourself, there's a, an amazing phonetician at University College London, that's where so many of them are, named Mark Huckvale. He has a web page that will teach you how to make these yourself. If you want to make those, you don't have these plastic molds and things, you can do it according to his, dec his directions. He will teach you how to do it, how to do it, how to Okay, so if you really are into this stuff, you can do it yourself. You could, that would be a great party trick, you know. <laughs> um, one phonetics stu two student found it hard to believe that our vocal tract really looks or is anything at all like the plastic tubes you see in the demonstration, and we've already seen the MRI gallery. They have a male and a female. It shows what our vocal tract looks like when it's making different vowels and that bending a tube doesn't affect the frequencies of the sound wave. Think of how horns can be coiled up. We covered that. Isn't it all amazing? Yes or no? Yes. yes. OK, and if you really want to read up on the science behind it, you can go to Latifoged's Elements of Acoustic Phonetics, or you can go to Keith Johnson's book on auditory phonetics. He, he also, I think it's called Auditory and Acoustic Phonetics. I'm, I'm not sure, but anyway, it's, it's similar to that. Look up Keith Johnson, you'll find it's his chef d'oeuvre, but it's, his really, it's his, his really wonderful book. I think it's in the third edition now. So more on vowels and formants to come. This is jumping ahead, but if you want to start early, go to page 11. So please review all the pages. If you want to listen to the files again, read over the text to make sure that you've absorbed everything. Okay. 
So go over those pages. Page 11, remember when I told you that pitch is not that hard to explain, but what did I say was the hardest part of this semester in acoustic phonetics? Loudness, decibels, that's the hardest part. That is hardcore physics and math. So I've made a tutorial about it, but before you do the tutorial, you need to review dui shu, logarithms. They're not hard. They are not hard. And the same guy who designed that wonderful page on how to make resonators to make your own vowels, he also, shh, on page 11, write this down, Page 11, he has designed an 18-page tutorial. Now, 18 sounds long, but each page has only a little bit of information. It's very easy to handle. All you need is one of these. Just have one of these ready. Everybody's going to need a scientific calculator for this class. If you don't have one, buy one. It'll make you feel really important and smart <laughs> and very scientific because you'll find uses for it from now on. I know we can do it on the computer, but the computer is too slow. Even an iPad, it's not that fun. I mean, it's very good. It's very good. It's very satisfying. So get a scientific calculator. They are under 1,000 NT. You can get a cheap one, but they probably won't last. Get a, don't get a really lousy one. At least that's what I paid back then. That's a long time ago. I think about you can, you can get a different one, but it's a scientific calculator. It doesn't need tons of stuff, but it needs this stuff. Here's with a, with a gang house of Casio. All of you, please, if you don't, most of you have one, don't you, or not? Okay, you have one, Miranda. Yeah. If you don't have one, I mean, we all love to shop, right? <laughs> Don't we love to shop? <laughs> because once you have it, you're going to find more uses for it, and you won't be lazy. When you see a calculation, you're going to try it out yourself. And then you'll read the book on how to use all the different buttons. It's really cool. I went through the whole manual to learn this thing, and I felt really good about it. So go over your math. Don't be intimidated by it. This tutorial will make you think, I can learn anything in math. Remember Christina, who I told, told, told you about? This is how she got her push. She got so inspired, and so she got her PhD doing lots and lots of math and physics, but doing speech therapy, okay? So that's the next one. I think we actually accomplished what I thought would be impossible. We got through all the web pages I planned to. I hoped to. I didn't plan to, I hoped to. It actually happened. So that means that next class we can start on Chapter 8. Now, I want you to start on it yourself, please, because it will be easier. And that way, um, everybody, please start to mark up your text before you read so you know what to stress and where to pause and where to put a continuation rise. And now that you have this background, I think, at least judging from the feedback that I see on your faces, I think all of you understood it. If you understood this, now chapter 8 is going to make sense. You are ready for it. If we had started chapter 8 with, without this, it would have been ito wushui, I can promise you. Okay? So I don't think I have anything to add to that. Go back to the web pages, play with them, show them to some of your smart friends who are curious. If they're the kind of people who are very passive and only do what they need for the test, then never mind. But if they're the curious kind of classmate, you might want to. You might want to show them some of this stuff because it will help you what? It will help you review and understand it better. When you explain it to someone else, it will be all the, all the more clear to you. So that, prepare the textbook. Now this stuff is going to make more sense to you. Not this, sorry, I meant to take this book. This book. This will, of course. But this is going to make more sense to you now. Go back over the parts that didn't make sense to you so far. And from now on, you should understand all the chapters OK. Do we have any chapters, comments, feedback? Not chapters, sorry. Any questions, comments, or feedback? Can anybody just, everybody just say one sentence, your reaction to the stuff that we covered in class today? Everybody just say one sentence. Silly. Math is really cool that we can train up math into something. Okay, good. Carol? Um, I think it's not as difficult as you say. 
Okay. Yeah. It's okay. It's not that bad. That's right. Okay, Vivian. So now you feel ready for it. Good. Okay, Amy? I just think that the mobile phones are actually a tug call. <laughs> yes! <laughs> that was the thing that impressed you most. Okay, Bella? It's fascinating. Yeah, neat stuff. Any? Yeah, it's cool to have a guitar play so we can be real life, not just textbook tones. And not just computer pages or web pages. I think what I remember best is that wonderful humming after Sophie sang at the string. Yeah. I remember that best. It was so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Is produced. Yeah. Okay, Miranda? With physical objects. It makes a difference, doesn't it? Remember I told you about toys? We still have more toys. That's that out. We have more toys coming. Okay. Tina? Good. I didn't know the real, really, real meaning of function, but now I know how it works. Good. Do you, do you kind of think back on the things you did in junior high and you think, oh, that's what they were talking about? Yeah. Okay. okay. You too? Yeah. Okay. Wendy? Finally, can tell my boyfriend that stuff that he doesn't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> Which a, friend? It's like a boyfriend. It's uh -huh. a fitness student. Ah. Does he show off with his scientific stuff sometimes? <laughs> Ah, so now you've, you're one up on him. I know something you don't know. Okay, that's it. The bell has rung. Have a, an exciting rest of the day.